Good morning. Good morning. Just give me a minute to get these spectacles on that work. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's a beautiful day out there. Things to do at home. We'll get them all done. Thank you. Okay, let us go to God in prayer. Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and mind be acceptable unto you this day, Lord. For we ask it all in your name, we praise and thank you. Amen. The title of the sermon today is called Trust. It's a sure, S-H-O-R-E thing. How many of you remember our former pastor, Matt Kelly? He was a big, jovial man who preached God's word in a folksy manner. I once asked Pastor Mac what his preaching style is. He thought for a moment, then replied, I'm a storyteller. Well, I feel as if I'm following in his footsteps, because as often as I've given a message, I find myself in the same preaching mode, storytelling. I hope you will indulge me at least one more time as I try, as Pastor Tom says, to get it right. It's June, 1968, and I am about to embark on the best summer of my life. Myself and five other guys have secured a job and living arrangements to spend the summer working at the Jersey Shore, Wildwood, New Jersey, to be specific. As a family, every summer, my parents and brothers will go to Wildwood for a week or two to enjoy the beach, the ocean, and the boardwalk. I always imagined what it would be like to work and live at the shore for the entire summer, enjoying all that the shore has to offer every single day. Now I was getting that chance. We all worked at the same restaurant as busboys and dishwashers, but I had a different job. My job was fountain boy, or as the job was called in the 50s, soda jerk. Yes, I made the Sundays and banana splits and whatever else was offered because this restaurant had a reputation for a variety of ice cream selections. Many a night, I would look out the window and see the line snaking around the corner and praying that my right arm would hold up for the duration of my shift as I tried to scoop the rock-hard ice cream from the containers. Nevertheless, I made it through, and every customer went home happy and full. <clears throat> One night, the general manager of the restaurant came to us and asked us if we would be willing to clean the restaurant after hours because the regular cleaning man had called off due to illness. We looked at each other and thought, you want to leave your restaurant in the hands of six teenage boys? This was like giving the cat the keys to the hen house. We collectively said yes. Then Mr. Craig, I, I still remember his name, said the cleaning includes floors, tables, bench seats, the kitchen, the baker's area, and of course the bathrooms. Bathrooms. We'd forgotten about the bathroom. <laughs> OK, we'll do it. One more thing, boys, he said. I know that you will take some food. Just don't take the big ticket items, like steaks, fillets, hams, fish, etc. Help yourself to some ground sirloin. Ground sirloin, you mean hamburger? We've had our fill of hamburgers. Help yourself to some ground sirloin when you have steaks in the freezer? Are you kidding me? The restaurant closed at midnight, and by 12.05 a.m., when the last customer had gone, the Jackie Gleason, Ray Conniff kind of Singers, and Montevani records went off, and out came the Beatles, Motown, the Beach Boys, and Jimi Hendrix. That place was rocking. Looking back, I'm surprised no one called the police to check on the noise level. We finished the job, and now it's time for our reward. Let's see, what did Mr. Craig say? Help yourself to anything, just leave the ground sirloin. Yes, that was it. No, it wasn't. We opened the freezer doors and looked at the sumptuous meats and fish and thought, we haven't had any food like this since we left home. Would he really miss one steak? We decided that he would. We took out one box of ground sirloin, closed the freezer doors, and on the way out, took one banana. The next day, while we were all at work, Mr. Craig called us aside and congratulated us on a job well done. Everything was neat clean, and in its proper place. Even the head cook and baker commented on how everything looked. 
And yes, the dreaded bathrooms were sparkling too. He told us that since we had done such a good job and had only taken one box of ground sirloin, that we would find on our next paycheck a $25 bonus. Now this is 1968. $25 at that time was a lot of money. As his way of thanking us and trusting us to do as he said. And that right there, folks, is the crux of this message, trust. Mr. Craig trusted us to do as he said. In retrospect, regarding this incident after 47 years, what did Mr. Craig see in the six boys from Philly? Did he see diligent, hardworking young men who arrived early for work and stayed late if needed? Did he see young men who cared about their job and his restaurant, so much so that they never missed a day of work and were always willing to help? What did he see that would lead him to trust us? After all, if we had taken items that we were not supposed to, he would have fired us, and I'm sure he would have secured replacements. As for us, it would not have looked good for us to have come home a lot earlier than expected and face our parents and explain why we did come home. Did Mr. Craig see Jesus? I don't know, but he had the faith to trust us. Do we have the faith to trust God to do as God says he will? Are we obedient to God's instruction to trust him to do as he says he will? There are many examples in the Bible of people trusting and obeying God. Moses trusted God to put the words in his mouth that he would speak, which would allow the Egyptian king to permit the Jews to be released from bondage. Noah trusted God that God would fulfill his promise of bringing a great flood to the earth. Yet Noah was being mocked by the people of his land for building an ark, which would eventually save his family and animals. Job trusted God to deliver him from the many tribulations that he was suffering. God rewarded him by blessing him with great wealth and restoration of his family. David trusted God to deliver him from the enemies and restore him to his position as king of Israel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God to deliver them from the fiery furnace. Daniel trusted God to deliver him from the lion's den. We could go on and on with other examples, but I think you get the gist of the message. Trusting God and allowing him to act in our lives is something as Christians we need to do. We need to step aside and let God be, when it, let God, be God when everything is going smoothly in our lives. We tend to dismiss God and rely on our own strength. However, when we face trials in our life, our strength seems to disappear and we become weak. In our personal weakness, we should turn to Jesus and rely on his divine strength to help us face these trials. Jesus gives us the strength and power to face these difficulties. We then become strong in spirit. Paul alluded to this strength in Christ when he spoke in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Have you ever felt yourself drifting from God because there is too much going on in your work life or family life? I, at times, have felt this way. I needed to slow down and get back to, in touch with God, but how do I do it? I discussed this issue with a friend, and he suggested that I read the Psalms. So I began my journey in the Psalms. I discovered that the Psalms are divided into five books. The first book is Psalms 1 through 40, 41. These psalms depict suffering, sorrow, and great joy. They teach God's love and care for us and how we should trust God in all of our day-to-day -day experiences of life. Since the most well-known psalm, Psalm 23, is in this group, I examined this psalm in different perspectives, relating it to a trust theme. I discovered the following explanation of the 23rd psalm and would like to share it with you. The Lord is my shepherd. That's a relationship. 
I shall not want. That's supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's rest. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. He restoreth my soul. That's healing. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. That's guidance for his name's sake. That's purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's testing. I will fear no evil. That's protection. For thou art with me. That's faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's discipline. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's hope. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's consecration. My cup runneth over. That's abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's a blessing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's security forever. That's eternity. God has made these promises to care for to care for and about us, just as David realized when he penned these words. Why then, as Christians, are we reluctant to trust God? Is it because we can't see God? Is it because we can't touch God? Is it because our own human nature will not allow us to step outside our own comfort zone and relinquish control to someone else, in this case, God? It's probably a combination of all three for most people. However, for one person, her trust in God was her whole life. This same friend that I alluded to earlier sent me some information regarding a Blessed Mary Elizabeth Hesselblad. She was a Bridgentine nun who was beatified in 2000 for her work with the poor, the sick, and the downtrodden. In 1904, she wrote, Dear Lord, I do not ask to see the path in darkness, in anguish, and in fear. I will hang on tightly to your hand, and I will close my eyes so that you know how much trust lays in you O spouse of my soul. The article goes on to say that hope in, every, hope in God and in his providence supported her in every moment, especially in times of testing, solitude, and the cross. She put the things of heaven before the things of earth, God's will before her own, the good of the neighbor before her own benefit. Can you do this? I can stand here and tell you that I cannot make that promise to God. My human nature will not allow it at this time. But you know what? This is a challenge that God has presented to me. I'm a work in process, and maybe someday, by God's grace, I can be as trusting of God as Mary Elizabeth Hesselblad was. Maybe you folks are a work in process, too. Take an introspective look at yourself and decide what is keeping you from trusting God. Pray about it and ask God for help to allow you and me to trust God as together we walk life's paths. As we know, being a Christian isn't easy, and God never promised that it would be. We are subject to the same problems that everyone encounters, whether they are financial, physical, emotional, psychological, etc. However, the difference for us is, as Christians, is that we have Jesus to help and guide us through the, these tribulations. For without Jesus, these issues would seem insurmountable. Jesus has provided a way for us to free ourselves from all of these problems. We can come to Jesus and lay all of our burdens on him, as Jesus proclaimed in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a choice to leave sin, trust in Jesus, and start following Jesus. Are we ready to do this? Are we ready to step out of the box and trust Jesus to do as he said he would? Jesus never makes a promise that he cannot keep. He is our friend our comforter, our guide, and our protector. Therefore, since Jesus has all these attributes, why, once again, I ask the question, why are we reluctant to trust him? We have friends that possess some of these same qualities, and yet we trust them explicitly. It's time for us as Christians to lift our eyes to the one God Almighty. 
place our hand in his and ask God to lead us to wherever God needs for us to go or do whatever God has planned for us and chosen for us to do. That is the faith, the hope, the obedience, and the trust that we need to exhibit as followers of Jesus Christ. 47 years ago, Mr. Craig must have seen something in those six boys from Philly to trust us. Today, in the present, let people see something in us. Let them see the love that we have for Jesus. Let them see how we honor and glorify Jesus in all that we do. Let them see the trust that we place in our Lord Jesus Christ. In essence, let them see Jesus. Trust God to allow God to reveal himself through you and me. If we can do this, people will take notice and may even tell us, I want what you have. Right there and then is our opportunity to witness for Jesus. Trust God to lead you. And if you do, it's a sure S-U-R-E thing that you will be abundantly blessed. Let us pray. Dear Father, you are our hope, refuge, and shelter. Help us to trust you in all aspects of our life, for if we do, our life will be one with you. Amen.